I want to welcome you to this teaching moment from Generations Christian Church. My name is Johnny Scott. I'm the senior pastor here at Generations. And one of my mentors told me long ago, as very young in ministry, he told me, so Johnny, the, the job of preaching, the job of a preacher at a local church is to whet the appetite of all, everyone in the congregation for the Word of God. I really hope that in these next few moments as we dive into a text and see how God's Word is alive and active, that one thing happens, that you get hungry for the Lord. And here's what happens in, in that process. Uh, G Jesus is going to have you pour yourself out so He can pour Himself into you. See, the less of ourselves we have, the more room, the more capacity we have in our lives for God to pour in. It's someone that's completely full of themselves that says, I'm not hungry for God. To get hungry for God, the first thing you've got to do is pour out everything that you have so you're an empty vessel waiting to be poured into. That's my prayer for you as we walk into this teaching time, whether you're going to listen to it on a podcast or you're catching up in the week, uh, wherever you're at during this moment, would you become lesser so that God can become greater in you. It's going to give you joy and you're going to get more from this teaching time if that's your mindset as you walk into this. You know, one other thing I want to tell you before we dive into this teaching is this. Uh, I, I grew up a kid going to uh, the local church. It was a local church with a, a youth pastor and a group of elders and volunteers at that church that transformed my life in really one of the, the deepest, darkest times of, of my story. And I still believe that the local church is God's plan for the salvation of the world. So if you are a, consider yourself a, a vital part of Generations Christian Church, and maybe you're on vacation with your family and you're going to watch online or you're, you're catching up doing a workout, I, I want to say this. Make sure that you're involved. Make sure you're involved in church because you can get content from so many places. But what God wants for you is to be a part of a local church where you're serving and you're giving and you're pouring into what God is doing there because there's more for you than just hearing a message. And there's going to be something I'm sure great in this message that the Spirit of God is going to use to transform your life. But you're missing out on a larger part if you're not really involved. And so if you're not in close proximity to Generations Christian Church and you're enjoying this teaching and it's being meaningful in your life, I'm, I'm so happy to hear that. Praise God for that. We're so excited to be able to bless you in this way. But I would, I would encourage you, find a church around you that you can serve and give at because that's God's ultimate plan is for all of us to be a part of the church because that's the bride that he's coming back for one day. Thanks for being with us today and may God use this teaching to bless your life. Well, good morning, church. We are very excited about that series that kicks off here in two weeks of all the sermon series that happen across our country. This one series that churches do at the movies is the highest percentage of people who don't go to church coming for the first time and connecting to Jesus, period. That's why we do it. We exist as a church under the mission of Jesus Christ, and he had a target in his mind, and his target were for people that did not know about him to engage in a conversation with him about the fact that he is real. And so we are sold out on this. There will be popcorn. It will smell like a movie theater. And people will come in and they will feel comfortable. And we've got, we're not telling you the movies. We're not. We're going to surprise you. Okay, we're not going to be like, well, tell, no, no, nope. I would never go to the movies like that. I mean, there's, nothing, there's no way. But we want to surprise. We have got some incredible lineup of movies, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to reach hearts. God's going to use. He is the greatest storyteller of all time, and God is going to shine through who his son is. So our commitment is if you bring someone, they're like, man, I'd never go to church. Like, no, come, come now. They're going to love it, and they're going to hear about Jesus. That's why... Uh, as I've been away on, on writing break, it's so great to be back. I've been away on a little bit of a study break here for a number of weeks, and I love this series. Like every week as we walk, welcome everyone online, as Jen and I and our family were gathering on Sunday, and we're engaging online and watching online, I'm like super jealous because I love all these conversations that Jesus has with people. A single conversation can change your life. I mean, th think back to conversations that you've had that have been coarse altering, that have just been a trajectory change. One conversation, 
You, you might be married to the person you're married to today because of one conversation on one day where that relationship went forward. You've got children in children's church today because of a simple conversation at one point in time. You've got a job. Maybe a teacher told you at one point, you can do better. You're worth more. And that one conversation changed what you do for a living, changed your identity, changed your life. Conversations matter. And I, there are some things that Jesus says in the text through the eyewitness accounts of the gospels where he's preaching to a large group of people and they're, they're great things, but I key in on, my, my, my world stops when he has an opportunity, a quiet moment, to go eyeball to eyeball, knee to knee in a chair with just one person. Of all the times that that happens in scripture, this one moment, John chapter four, is the moment of all of them where Jesus says, I've got I've to see this person. And he has a conversation with one person. And what's so great about this, we're, we're transported. John is very clear that he writes his gospel to say, I want to prove to you that Jesus is real. And he puts this conversation in John chapter 4 in this gospel for this reason. We can, although you might be at home or sitting in this room, we can be put ourselves into the conversation and say, well, what would Jesus say to me? And what, what questions would, would I ask of Jesus? What would be my response if Jesus were to say, hey, you, do you have a minute? Like, how would I respond to him? It all happens right here in this text. We get a be in the moment. So go with me. John chapter four, verse one begins. Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. This is why Jesus says, you'll do greater things than me. Jesus says that to his apostles. One of the reasons is you, you today, you get to go and baptize. Jesus never baptized anyone. We get to expand the kingdom. You get in the tank. This is why a lot of times when we baptize people here, we call it a tank party. It's like, who's with you? We're all getting in. Because we want to, you don't need a professional priest or pastor to do that. Jesus didn't set it up that way. We all get to go and connect people to Jesus. That's what's happening here. But Jesus is controlling his own destiny. He will give himself up for sacrifice for all men but not until he's ready on a very specific day. That time is not here. So here's what happens. Verse three, he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Pause here. The text is very clear and it's, meaning in verse five, Jesus had to go through Samaria. Nobody traveling with Jesus needed to go through Samaria. There's a route, a road called the Transjordan. It's a road. This is the route that every Jew would take to go around Samaria because there's great deep animosity between Jews and Samaritans. Samaritans are a people group that exists and is made up this way. When, when God's kingdom David and Solomon and the kings, the sons of David and Solomon, fall away from God. God brings judgment on Israel. This is called the fall of Israel. The kingdom is divided north to south. Assyria comes in. Babylon, uh, the, the Syrians come in and they destroy Israel. And Israel is dispersed. The great diaspora. This sets up the fact that there would be Judeo-Christian thought centers, synagogues, all throughout the Roman Empire because God's kingdom had been spread out. And in this moment, this great spreading out that happens in here, there's a remnant that's left in the Palestine Canaan area. And they marry Assyrians and they do not want for Nehemiah and Ezra to come back and build the temple that Jesus will walk through. Jesus will walk up into the temple that ne Nehemiah and Ezra build and they do not want this. So they even conspire against the Jews. For this reason, the Jews, there's a hatred of Samaritans. They do not worship in the same place. And there's great disagreement, a sectarian divide between them. And Jesus does not go the Transjordan route. Jesus goes straight through Samaria. And you're going to see why. Verse 6, Jacob's well was there. Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, he sat down by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water. Jesus said to her, 
will you give me a drink? In parentheses, his disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? Another parenthesis statement here. For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Her response is, why are you talking to me? What's going on? What, what is happening here that you would even talk to me? Uh, there, there's, a, there's a thing going on here that I, I deeply resonate with because I do it. It's called avoidance. It's noon. And it's like it is in Florida right now. It is blazing hot, right? We're getting ready to go back to school this week. Excited for schools. Uh, I want to make sure that you all know that next week, as our kids, you know, they get like a three-day start, many schools. Uh, we're going to be doing a very specific prayer time, acknowledge moment for schools and for those who serve our schools and for learners as they go back into our education systems. And we're very excited about that. We're going to uh, kind of mark that next week with a dedicated time of prayer for all of those teachers and resource officers and really kind of pray that up. We're very excited. But here, I get excited when I love the routine. I love coming back and routine. But you also know it comes in the fall, right? Football's back. Right. And I'm so it's not just football. Like when my wife gets excited about that, when I say football's back, she thinks it's time to get a, a sweater on, you know, and get cocoa and put YouTube fireplace on. Right. Get my IU sweatshirt on. I got heckled in first service for that. Woo. So that's what I'm thinking. Right. Because I'm from the north. And that's not what it's like down here, though. We've got like four more months of winter, okay? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It like hangs on, you know, it's September. Winter's like, I'm not done with you. Summer's not done with us. Uh, and that's what's going on here. It's hot. This woman is going to the well at noontime for the same reason that you go to Target at that specific time you go to Target, okay? When you go to Target at that time that you go, you're going because you want to see nobody at Target. You want to walk around and bump into nobody because you're not like looking like Target is ready to see you. You want some personal, you can't get it on Amazon. You got to go to Target. You just want to be there and see nobody, which means you will see everybody. Right? That's what's going to like, what are you doing here? They're closing 10 minutes. I came here on purpose at this time. That's what this woman's doing. She's avoiding she doesn't want to see other women in town. She doesn't want to see other people. See, normal people go in the morning when it's nice and cool and they chat together and they get the water because when you wake up early, you need water for everything you do in the morning. They get their supply of water for the full day. And she's doing what I do. Maybe you resonate today and she's doing this. She's avoiding. Here's when Jesus shows up in our lives and says, he says, can I have a moment? Jesus shows up for a conversation when we're avoiding. Jesus shows up for a conversation in your life when you're avoiding something. See, all the things that you can do, you do those things, right? You do them first. You do all the easy, fixable things. When my wife asks me about something and I say, I have a plan, that means I have no plan, <laughs> okay? Okay. Because if I had a plan, it would already be done. I would have already fixed it. It would have like checked off the list. There are things that we're avoiding because we have no plan. And Jesus shows up and he says, you're avoiding something. She was avoiding something and Jesus knows it. Think about what Jesus is willing to fight through. His, his followers were most likely upset that they had to walk through here. And Jesus knows this well. She's been coming to this well at this time. And I believe, I believe this with all the conviction I have that on the way there, in his mind and in his heart, he knows every day she's gonna be there. She's gonna be there. And he's like, I'll be there in three days. I'll be there in three days. And he's coming to have a conversation with her about what she's avoiding. He does that with you today. Jesus has been waiting for this day because he knows the word of God is gonna be opened. And he says, do you have a minute? And there's something that you're avoiding and you can't fix it. If you could, you would. And Jesus says, can I talk to you about that? I've gone out of my way. I've fought through so many things to be here. There's nothing that I would not do to come to you and say, I want to talk with you. Her answer was not yes or no. 
And Jews are super picky about ceremony and cleanliness. She's like, what are you, what are you, you're not going to have like my cooties. You know, you're not going to share a drink with me, man. So her answer is a non-answer. Jesus says to her when she says, how can you ask me for a drink? Verse nine, Jesus says, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. There's no chit chat here with Jesus. He's just going at it. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself and did his sons and his livestock? And Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. Whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. If this was all you had ever heard in your entire life of the God, this would be enough. Like this one tiny piece of wisdom could sum up all of the toil, all of the things that you're working on, all of the frustration in your life. This one passage, this one conversation with Jesus would be enough. What he says here, he just drops it. Let me put it in terms that are maybe more applicable to our current situation in life. See, when there's something that we're avoiding, if you're like me, I, I, I'm, I'm avoiding something that I run to something else that's going to give me satisfaction or reprieve or that, ah, right? Well, I don't want to do that. I want to do that. I want to do that. I want to run to this. And here's what Jesus says, the problem with the avoidance and running to that thing that we medicate with, that, that shot of dopamine. He knows what you already know, that it's temporary. The fix, the anecdote the, the feeling of, ah, this is, I don't want that. I want this because it helps me forget about that or avoid that, that, ah, moment. It's, it's harder and harder to satisfy. And Jesus says, it's not going to stop. You're going to have to keep coming back to it. You have to keep coming back to it. And here's, he's like, well, here's what I'll do. And this, this would be my point. My point is this, Jesus trades us. Jesus trades us what we're avoiding for life change. She's there because she's avoiding something. And Jesus says, I have, a, I have an offer for you. I'll take avoidance. It's not about the water. And I'll give you something that is within you that replenishes. It's, it restarts on its own. This is like a buy it now, auto ship, save 5%. It just shows up on your doorstep. Right when you think we're out of dog food, boom, how'd they know? Auto ship. It's brilliant. Jesus invented that, right? He was way ahead of Amazon. It's like, I can give you this thing that self-replenishes all the time. This moment, like th this offer that he gives her, it's available right now to you today. The thing that you're avoiding, Jesus says, I want a conversation. And in the conversation, what he's offering you is I'll take the thing that you can't fix and don't have the resources or ability or the, the fix-it tool and I'm going to give you, I'm going to take that from you. And I'm going to give you something that's going to just blow your mind. I'm going to give you something that is life changing. You're never going to need the medicine, anecdote, run to thing again. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. She's like, sold. You have a customer. Let's draw up the paperwork. I'm ready to sign. How do we do this deal? I want, I want the transaction. I'm buying. Verse 16. Jesus said to her, go, call your husband and come back. So in this scenario, he's like, it takes two people. You got to buy it together. It's a, you know, we only sell to two people. You have to have a cosigner. You need a cosigner. So here's what she says. Verse 17, I have no husband, she replied. She's like, I don't need a cosigner. I just want to buy it myself, right? No cosigner, just me. And Jesus replies, verse 18, 17, the second part of it, B. 
You are right when you say that you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. So what you have just said is quite true. Verse 19, sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. <laughs> I'm dealing with a different situation here with you. Like, I'm, I'm beginning to understand that you've got a thing. Like there's a gift on you. I, I, you're not just another person out here bugging me at my private Target shopping time. My, uh, my family is, ha kind of, we're, we're, the kids have pushed me this summer into an app. Um, there's, there's a brand new app and I, I just feel like I feel compelled to tell you about it so you can run away from it, okay? Um, and, and I'm all, I'm, I'm, whatever they're into, I want to, you know, be into it. And they're all on it. They're, they're talking about it. And they first, they start doing it when we were away for a few weeks. And when I hear about what the premise is, the app is called, you guys probably all know about it. You're smiling. You already know. See, you guys, if you're old, most of you are, just take the hit. <laughs> you don't be pointing at people. You're going you're gonna to get some cool points because you're going to be on the end. The app is called Be Real, Right? Right? So the, the saying in my house is, if you have the app on, is be real someplace else. Okay? And I'm going to explain to you why. Here's how this app works. Okay? We got it up. On, the, on, on your right up here, this is my daughter-in-law, Mallory. Um, that's, that's her be real post from, I believe, yesterday. Anthony Bucari. Anthony was working at the Trinity Farmer's Market when it went on. 10-17, the notice went out. Wherever you are in America, be real. Finley was explaining it to me late one night and I did not approve that picture. I just wanted to go to bed. That's, that's my face that says be real someplace else. Okay, here's the, now this is scary. This is the premise of this app, the be real app. You don't know when, but you're gonna get notified. And at that moment, whatever you're doing, you have to be real. So you've got to take a picture of what's in front of you, okay? out there and then you have two seconds like thousand one thousand two then it takes a picture of your face and you make a face like your own emoji of like your experience like you're sad or you're happy or you're whatever and but there's some there's some built-in honesty this is what I just I'm fascinated by this what's built into this app is um, authenticity because if you're not real it will tell all of your friends that you're a faker okay <laughs> here's how it does it at 1017, so Mallory was really good. Mallory was driving. And so it told me that Mallory posted her be real moment five minutes later because she, she had to wait till she could get off the road. She's a good driver. Thank you, Mallory. And she did it, you know, so that's real enough for me, five minutes. Now, Finley has a friend named Robbie, not to throw Robbie under the bus, but Robbie, you're under the bus. Robbie, uh, it tells you how many attempts you take at your photos at being real. <laughs> See, the kids over here in the student section, they're laughing because they know. They know that, that this is, it will, this app will rat you out. Robbie took the app, get this, the app is called Be Real. Robbie took eight photos before he decided. You know, Robbie's like, no, not down, you know, like imposing. And so it'll tell like picture taken four hours later. So if you're, everyone wants to be fake, you know, on Instagram, you're like, I'm jet skiing today or I'm, I'm in Idaho, you know, and like all this cool stuff. And so some people will wait four hours till they're doing something cool because at the moment the app hits, you could be brushing your teeth. But the app is called Be Real, folks, right? And so uh, in my house, you know, I told my kids, I'm not a part of your own life. You be, you be real somewhere else. I don't want that posted, right? Jesus shows up and he's real. The clinical studies and trials that are being submitted now, a year of coming out of COVID, are unprecedented. In the history of humanity, we've not seen a group of people as large as the world's population go through what we went through with our current information, technology, ability to tell everybody what's going on. And the psychological, emotional strain of what has happened to people in the last two years has set us up for an unprecedented amount of mental illness and loneliness. And Jesus shows up to you and he says, be real. 
in his conversation. How many of you have a real conversation? I mean, tomorrow's Monday morning. It is the most unauthentic hour of the, the week. We all show up and say, how was your weekend? Great. How was yours? Fine. That's all code for leave me alone. <laughs> if you start to answer that question and you're longer than five seconds, stop it. It's Monday. People getting to work. Jesus is the only person in your life that will show up. And here's what he says to you. I already know it. I already know. He tells this woman, this is not mean. He is not listing her sins and failures. This is not like, oh, of course, you know, he's telling this, all this lady's fault. No, 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 no. He's telling her, I know. I know the stuff in your life. I know the things that you are avoiding. You know why she doesn't want to go to the well? Because those women in that town are going to rip her apart. Everyone's talking about her. She doesn't want to exist. She wants to get her water and do it in private. And Jesus shows up and he says, I know. You know what he says to you right now about the thing that the Holy Spirit is telling you that you're avoiding? He says this, I know. I know your pain. I know what you're afraid of. I know what your greatest hopes are. I know what your fear is right now. I'll trade you life everlasting in a way that you can't even imagine for that. There's a big mistake that I see in all these moments with Jesus. You know, just last week, watching last week's message, uh, watching Riley talk about Nicodemus. Nicodemus in that moment, he's like, I just don't get it. I don't get it. And it's the same thing happens here. It's repetitive. It happens in my life. Maybe it's happening in your life. Jesus is describing something and our miss, our miss on it is this. What he offers us is so much more beautiful and amazing and life-changing that we can't wrap our minds around it. Here's what happens in verse 19. Sir, the woman said, I see you're a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim the place that we must worship is in Jerusalem. Quick pause. Jesus comes to her and he says passionately, I know everything in your life and I'll change your life. And she says, could we talk about politics for a moment, sir? That's literally what happens. She's like, well, now that you know all of my deepest, darkest sins and past, and it's just us here, and you're offering me the world, the lottery, and you're going to change everything. Can I talk to you about a political issue I've got a concern about? What? We, we do this. And Jesus responds, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Amen. We're worshiping today in Trinity, Florida, unless you're online from Colorado. Welcome. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know for salvation is from the Jews. Jesus came through God's prophet Abraham and through his lineage. That's true. Yet a time is coming, verse 23, and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. See, the spirit always leads you to truth. That's why right now, it's, Jesus says, it's good that I go. Because Jesus is saying this right now, that thing that you're avoiding, I'm naming it. He's naming it. The spirit of God is naming it in your mind right now. He says this, they are the kind of worshiper the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and the truth. The woman said, I know that there's a Messiah who's called the Christ who's supposed to be coming. When he comes, he'll explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Do you hear it? Jesus says this today, I know it all. I know what you're avoiding and your need and need conversation, your intimate moment, your be real moment with Jesus. Here's what he has to say to you. I am real. I am here. I am engaging you with what's going on in your life. I want to be meaningful in your life. My favorite, one of my favorite authors, John Eldridge wrote a book called Wild at Heart. I buy and buy the, like used by the stack of 10. If a young man comes to my office, I'm like, read this, we'll have coffee. He wrote a book called Fathered by God. Every man, read it. 
read it. The, one of the best books I've ever read. Him and his wife did a book called Captivating, John and Stacy Eldridge. Stacy writes this book. My wife will buy a bunch of these and when she talks with women, it's captivating. I've read sections of this book. There's a moment in the book where Stacy is very transparent. See, John is this kind of like hunter, outdoorsman, man's man, rough and tumble, you know, Esau, like, let's, let's go experience the world, cowboy it up, you know, kind of deal. And he, he loves like whales. He's got this, you know, fascination. And he was on a beach one day and he saw like a humpback whale came right off the beach and kind of, it was just him alone. And this humpback whale comes out of the water. And it was like that moment on Elf where Norwal comes out. I was like, hey buddy, hope you find your dad, you know? And it was this beautiful moment just for John and Stacy. She, she talks about that. And she's like, I want, I want a moment. I want my moment where Jesus shows up in a conversation with me and he says, I see you. I see your past. I've got a future for you. I know everything and I'll take what you're avoiding and I'll, I'm here, I'm real. And Stacy's like, well, I want a whale moment. She goes out on the beach. She's like, all right, God, it's my turn. It's my turn. You love me too. I'm just as important as John. No whale. She's just angry. It's that one of those moments where it's like, I'm going to give God a piece of my mind. Have you ever been there? Let me, con let me convince you. He's big enough to take it. He's big enough to take it. His answer might be what he said to Joe. Where were you when I formed the foundations of the earth? So Stacy's walking along and there's no whale, but she sees a starfish. And it's a nice starfish. And she's like, oh, I get it. I get it. John gets a whale the largest animal on the planet that's alive, and I get a starfish. Am I supposed to be thankful? Well, technically, yes. That's the, that's the theological. You are. But here's who he is. And I, I believe this with, I think it is a thread throughout Scripture. I think it's in every story. He will show up in your life, and he will say this to you. I am a rock, and I will not move. You've tried five relationships and either because of brokenness in you or you can't find a good man in cigar, it's not worked, lady, but you can drink of my water and you will never thirst again. Stacy continues to walk along the beach and she's wrestling with, I get a starfish. I gotta be content with a starfish. I'm starfish good. I'm starfish worthy. One star, okay. And she sees a cave. She walks in to explore the cave and as she comes around the corner of a cave in this one cave floor to ceiling fully encompassing her it's just like a starfish dedicated aquarium alive beautiful glistening colors vibrant and the sun speaking through and it's just like this amazing moment where she's like it's not one starfish I have come that you would have life okay I would come that you would have life and have it just getting by. He says, no, I come that you would have life abundant. And Jesus offers the great exchange. I'll take everything you're avoiding and I will be a rock that will not move. You know, only John writes about this moment. John wrote his gospel last. All of the other moments, if, if, I mean, if all four Gospels, eyewitness accounts were the exact same, we'd be like, great, you know. But it, it's nice to have some other stuff. The Holy Spirit wanted for you to understand what Jesus would fight through to get just to you so you could have a moment that mattered to you. If I walked into a cave and there was a bunch of starfish in it, I'd be like, huh, starfish, great. Ice cream, anyone? Seriously. Like, but God has done things in my life that I would go home and tell Jennifer, babe, you gotta see this. And she'd be like, that's great. I made tacos for dinner, Are you ready? I'm like, no, you don't understand it. He will do that for you because you matter to him. Your relationship matters. And I'm gonna tell you what he wants to tell you, period, today. It's what he said to her in this text. The person that you're looking for, I'm here. I'm real, I'm alive. I conquered death. I can fix your life if you just come and surrender to me. I am he. And can I tell you something about him? He is a rock that won't move. And when you build your life on Jesus, the shifting sand 
that's underneath you where you can't start to get any traction starts to firm up. And you start to get a foundation that when the waves of this earth come at you, it won't shock you, it won't move you because you got something inside of you on auto shift. It keeps renewing, it keeps bringing life. So church, you need a conversation. And we gotta stop avoiding and do that great exchange. Come on, would you stand? And can we declare who he is? Declare what he's like and build our lives on him.